Welcome to the Rewilded Human Podcast, where Dr. Lucille and Lynn will tackle your most difficult and intimate questions with candor, tough love, and a little dash of humor. In today's episode, so a lot of women are going through menopause while they have teenagers. So the teenagers are going through the hormonal changes while the mother is going through the hormonal changes, and it's like a hurricane right? Well, this didn't happen yes. in the past. And now this is this is a real issue. And it's a real problem. And, and really, the only thing you can do is to be there for your child, keep the communication lines open. No, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if you have a girl or a boy, you didn't mention Jill, but you know, just always be there with an open heart and an understanding. Welcome, everybody, to the episode seven of the Rewilded podcast, the Rewilded Human podcast. Uh, I'm Dr. Lucille, and here is my fabulous partner, uh, Lynn Hardy. And we are so thrilled to be here and and discussing your questions. Uh, Please, if you're enjoying the podcast, please comment, give us a like, and subscribe so that we can continue to do this and serve you the best way we can. So, Lynn, would you like to start with the first question? Absolutely. So we have a question from Sherry. I often find myself overwhelmed with a never-ending to-do list, and it triggers my anxiety. What strategies can you suggest for managing stress, anxiety, and tackling tasks more effectively when it feels like there's just too much to do? Well, I think this is very common in today's world. And um, a lot of people, especially women, are feeling this, Sherry. So I can I can totally understand this. And I think we've all felt like this a lot of times in our lives. And um, there are definitely different strategies that you can do. And um, if you feel like you have never-ending to-do lists, so you hopefully have a list. And I think having a list is a good start. So you can start marking, checking things off. Um, I think it's really important to prioritize everything and make sure that you're, you know, that you're at the top of the list as well, because a lot of times when we have so many to-do lists and so many things to take care of and so much anxiety and triggers, then we kind of forget to take care of ourselves, which makes it much more difficult to take care of the other things on the list. What do you think, Lucille? Do you experience this as well? Oh, uh, you know, I've been struggling with this, I think, all of my life. And it's only like very recently that I'm starting to get a handle on it. Uh, And one of the things, uh, a number of things that I I would suggest, um, first of all, your own mindset, because I always have this mindset of perfectionism, and I have to do everything, like, and I have to do it all great. And it, it has to all be done today, if not yesterday, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I realized that that's just uh, bringing me closer and closer to burnout. That attitude had to go. And I had to become very, very realistic about, well, what can I do in a day? I can't just give myself a million things to do. And then at the end of the day, be beating my head against a wall because I obviously couldn't do them all. Crazy, crazy, crazy way to go through life. Um, And I agree with Lynn. You have to be very mindful of your own energies and how the to-do list is hijacking you and hijacking your energies and ultimately draining you, right? Because, you you know, we all get that little dopamine higher for every time we check off. I did this. I did that. I did that. But the dopamine high does not sustain you because, you know, you're just wasting dopamine. Mm -hmm. It's true. (laughs) It's just flowing out of you. And then and then at the end of the day, where are you? You're like, you know, completely uh, like a wet noodle uh, by the end of the day. So um, it's it's really important to get a perspective on what is the most important thing? Why am I doing all of these things? And where is my own health and well-being in relationship to all of this stuff? Is that is that a priority? Sometimes we do way too much because we do not make ourselves a priori- priority. We make everybody else 
a priority. And, you know, if they have needs, we just fill them. We just keep filling those, those needs. And you will definitely burn out or get ill or, you know, um, start having serious consequences if you continue doing it that way. So I don't mean to scare you, but uh, I'm, I'm glad in a sense that you're, you're feeling frustrated with this. But I think the frustration has to, uh, will help motivate you to change if you're frustrated more about how you're not having a good quality of life about how you no know, matter how hard you work you can't seem to be getting ahead and it's really really draining you and really making you feel overwhelmed i think the first thing that has to change is your mindset really is this the one kind of life you want to lead it was so painful for me i don't know if you've got you probably you're such a go-getter lynn and you do so many things <laughs> i i'm all stuff you get done in a day but um for me it was like i just saw that I was like a, a robot. I became a robot, like doing, 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 doing. And where was my life? It's mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. You know? so, and it was hard. You know, it is hard, hard to say to yourself, be realistic. I had to keep saying that to myself. Be realistic. You cannot do all of this. You mm -hmm. can't have that wish. It says, oh, yeah, I should be able to do all of this. Why? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it really became very apparent to me that I'm here to be in the best possible health, uh, enjoy my life as much as I possibly can. So I can give really things of real value mm -hmm. to other people, not just a million things in a day. It's the some value things, that I want. I want you, can also, uh, you can outsource some things, you know, it's like we become control freaks and we want to do everything ourselves. For example, if you're able to and you can afford, hire a maid once a week to help you with the housework so you don't feel overwhelmed with that. You know, I, I did that very early in my career because I said I would rather go and work an extra day and hire someone else to do the housework, which I hate doing. Right. I'd rather go and do yeah. the work that I, I love doing. So delegating, getting the kids involved, getting them, giving them chores, getting them to help, because as women, often we feel like we have to do everything. You know, the, the housework, yeah. go to work, take care of the kids, everything else. Ask your husband for help if you have a husband. I mean, there are so many things you can do. And some things can wait. If you don't do the laundry today, nothing's going to happen. No one's going to die because the laundry is mm -hmm. not done, right? So that can wait until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is just pressure that we put on ourselves that we have to do this. We must do this. But it's what, what what's the worst that can happen if you don't complete this task today? Like, is it really that important that it has to be done? And if it's not, then leave it for tomorrow. I mean, the Spanish, I'm in Spain right now, yeah. and the Spanish have this great attitude, mañana, which means tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They don't stress about yeah. today or what needs to be done today. You know, they go down for their siesta from two to four, everything closes, everyone goes to sleep, and they have the longest lives in, in Europe. And I think most of the world, I think second to Japan. Why? Because mañana, mañana, they don't care about having stuff done today. So I think we can learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is just their attitude. Oh yeah, right. And and maybe share. Yeah. Maybe maybe yeah, you're, you're not a very good organizer. Maybe you need to learn some organizational skills or time management skills. Sometimes that can be very helpful as well. But a lot of it really is just attitude, right? Yes, and uh, yes, and I I can tell you that uh, it was excruciatingly painful for me, but I finally got myself to do it. Where I got myself. To bed on time, no matter if I had done the list or I didn't do the list. And it was excruciatingly painful for me to see dirty dishes pile up in my kitchen. But I thought, you know what? My sleep is more important. You yeah. know, having some kind of quality of life at the end of the day is important to me. The yeah. dishes are not important. Exactly. And, and, exactly. A, and after a while, you know, like, like the Span Spaniards, it was like, for the dishes, mañana. Mañana. <laughs> mañana. And, it was, and it's fine. Exactly. Project, right? Exactly. And nothing happens. Um, They're there in the morning waiting for you. That's right. Yes. Exactly. Um, and, and there are so many good resources out there, too. Um, you know, uh, Sherry, you can go to uh, uh, some great authors out there, like Michael Hyatt um, writes a lot about how to uh, prioritize, how to schedule things, and Stephen Covey. If you've heard about the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, he has a great system for how to plan out your day so that you get the most important things done. You identify what they are and you get the most important things done. So I highly recommend you um, check into those resources as well. Yeah, that's a great recommendation, Lucilla. I know Mel Robbins also just had a recent episode. She had someone on and it was all about organizational skills and time management. So yeah, there's some really good resources out there, definitely. So mm -hmm. we hope that will help you a little bit, Sherry. Yes. Thanks a lot, Sherry. Thank you. So um, our next question is from Jill. Dear Dr. Lucille and Lynn, I'm a mother struggling to connect with my teenager lately. How, how can I foster a stronger bond and open lines of communication with my child? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Um, Jill? Well, well uh, you're the lock, mother. Lock her in the basement until <laughs> she's 21. <laughs> If that doesn't work, okay, I'm kidding, kidding, but not kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Connecting with teenager lately. I think we, I mean, as, as mothers, we definitely go through that. And, and I'm sure you've had a lot of clients, Lucille, who have come to see you for this reason, yes. because they're having a really difficult time connecting with their teenagers. Um, it's, it's a really tough time for everybody. It's a tough time for oh. the... For, for the teenagers because they're they're going through these changes their hormones are all over the place so they don't know what's happening and they're really torn between like wanting to be independent and wanting mama's love and you know they kind of bounce back and forth and and they don't know what to do with their emotions and of course your emotions are all over the place and now a lot of a lot of because you know we're having children much later in life so a lot of women are going through menopause while they have teenagers. So the teenagers are going through the hormonal changes while the mother is going through the hormonal changes and it's like a hurricane, right? <laughs> well, this didn't happen yes. in the past and now this is this is a real issue and it's a real problem. And, and really the only thing you can do is to be there for your child, keep the communication lines open. No, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if you have a girl or a boy, you didn't mention Jill, but you know, just always be there with an open heart and an understanding. You don't really want to be your child's best friend because I think the relationship should, should be different from that. But I think your child should always feel comfortable coming to you for help. And, you know, for example, if they're out drinking, see my crazy dog in the background. Uh, if you go out drinking, then, you know, <laughs> then you, you should know that it's okay to call your mom and she'll come and pick you up at three o'clock in the morning if you need to. Don't ever get in the car with someone who's been drinking or don't ever drive like that. So you, you want to have that kind of relationship with your mother where you feel safe telling her anything and coming to her with any issues, with any problems or anything like that. So to me, that's the most important thing to, to that your child trusts you and knows that they can come to you with anything. Lucille, what do you think? Oh, I think that's excellent advice. And I think that you are the best expert on this because mm -hmm. you actually went through it yourself. Um, so, you know, um, one thing I always tell my parent uh, clients is how your child is now in no way predicts how they're going to be after they're 18, 20, or 22. Like I've had clients come in and they're tearing their hair out. Their kids are, you know, experimenting with drugs. They're out all night, all, all sorts of acting out. Um, and they just are like totally overwhelmed, scared. They have no idea what to do. And as we help, you know, kind of help, each other kind of brainstorm how to deal with this um always 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 i tell them listen this is the turmoil that you're experiencing now with your child but they inevitably the vast majority of them settle down and they look very different later on it's in true. life you know? okay. um i think in our world we make it really hard for uh kids to transition into being highly dependent on their parents into being more independent. I think that's really, really hard in our world. And we tend to do it in a very bizarre way where we um, we make the kids kind of um, in schools and in other settings, it's kind of like they have to be uh, 
put more into their peer group, which is important. They need to be more in their peer group, but it's kind of, kind of like the acceptance that they have to reject their parents or reject their families and bond and be loyal to their uh, teenage friends. And I don't know, I, I kind of like the old tribal uh, paradigm where uh, kids grew up with all the generations together, mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't like in order to grow up, you had to be separated from your parents and detach from them and do all sorts of crazy and wild things and just bond with your teenage friends. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's important that um, the kids uh, have a strong sense of, you know, kind of multi-generational multi -generational bonds so that they, they get the wisdom from the older uh, members of the family. They 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 help to nurture and mentor the younger kids um they still have their peer-to-peer -peer bonds and i think that makes them much more stable mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest mm -hmm. as they're going through this really crazy transition uh, yeah, to have the balance years. balance between the, the balance. two yeah mm -hmm. exactly yeah and maybe we're missing the rituals that we used to have where you actually become an adult you know how like yeah. tribe tribes would have these rituals into adulthood so this way we don't really know where the line is am i a child am i an adult you know like you don't really yeah. have these these things that used to be part of societies which is which is quite in, quite interesting so yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a it's a tough time but i can tell you like i i my my son was pretty good i was very lucky but we did go through a phase he was around 17 18 where I had like a summer from hell, you know, he rebelled against everything. He was out all night doing all kinds of stuff. I didn't sleep the whole summer. I think I aged 10 years that summer. And I thought he's never going to be normal again. And the thing is, you know, the relationship that you build early on with your child, even when they rebel against you and you feel like they're, they hate you, they can't even stand you. Maybe you have moments where you hate them back. It will pass. Just like Dr. Lucille said, it's going to pass. And when it does, and you have a beautiful adult child, you can have the most amazing relationship and they will honor you and they will love you and they will respect you. And, mm -hmm. and you will realize that a lot of that stuff was just really hormonal and they, they weren't doing anything malicious or, you know, the fact that they're trying to break away from you and not connect with you that much. That's kind of part of the natural process where they need to gain their independence. So you need to let them go a little bit and not, you know, try to pull them back and just know that because the love and the connection is there, they will naturally gravitate back to you. And, it, and it's really beautiful yeah. to have an adult child with a beautiful relationship where they call you every day and they want to see you and they ask you for advice and your opinion is important to them. And that's going to come. And, and in most relationship that comes mm -hmm. in the future. So you just need to kind of write it out and be patient and be loving and know that this too shall pass. Great advice, great advice. So if we, if we think about, you know, your specific question of how to foster a stronger bond and open lines of communication, um, I think it, it's important to realize what Lynn said. You may not be able to get that stronger bond at this time of the child's life but you know you you may just give the child the sense that you're still there for them just as lynn said you're still always there for them you know you know you you don't want to make, make it really intense you don't want the child to think oh my god my mom's freaking out because i'm not you know uh, doing what she wants me to do you want to keep it light you want to keep you know, maybe uh, suggesting that you do something that you both enjoy together, if there is something you both enjoy together, and be prepared to be rejected. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't take it personally. It's not about you. It's just that, you know, they're going to want to be with their other friends more than they want to be with you. But that too, as, as Lynn says, that too is going to change yeah. over time. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. When, they, when they're grown and they have children and they want to dump the kids on you, they're going to love you again. <laughs> Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> they yes. will love you and appreciate you again. Our next question comes from yeah. an anonymous follower. And so, guys, you don't need to give your names or you can give us fake names, whatever you want. You know, we don't want to call out anyone publicly if you don't want us to. So anonymous is absolutely fine. The question is, why do we call ourselves an idiot when we make a mistake or get something wrong? 
and how to stop doing it. So this kind of like self-sabotage, right? Calling yourself mm. an idiot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why would someone do this, Lucille? Why do you think someone would like you know, question well, themselves or second guess what they did or? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, when I was growing up, my father's favorite word in the entire English vocabulary was stupid. And everything he disagreed with was stupid. And when I would voice an opinion that he didn't agree with, I was stupid, right? So, um, and a lot of kids get that, you know. Parents, uh, whether they're aware of what they're doing or not, they will give their kids uh, that message that there's something wrong with them if they're doing something the parent doesn't like, right? Yes. So, you know, we're very imprintable beings. So, like we can, we get programmed very easily, especially in childhood. So, you know, um, Anonymous, if you think about, you know, how were you raised? Was there constant uh, labeling, like shaming or labeling of, you know, you being bad or stupid or uh, an idiot uh, as you were growing up? I, I'm always, I don't know, Lynn, when you go out in public, sometimes aren't you shocked if you hear some things that your the parents say to their children? Yes. In, you know, like, get away from that. You're, what are you doing? Are you stupid? Or, yeah. You, know, you want to die? Why? Yeah. Well, yes. No, it's like, wow. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, you might want to consider that, you know, it's not really your fault that you're doing it. You're, we have very programmable brains and mm -hmm. take this on. Um, and, you know, the other very interesting thing about this is that um, when I have worked with people around this, they will often construct a story of why it's important for them to keep calling themselves an idiot. Really? And, the story off, often goes, well, if I don't beat up on myself, then I'm just going to relax and I'm going to become even more of an idiot. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, How I, sad I, is that? I kid you not. This happens time and time and time again. I have to be like hyper vigilant about my behavior and I have to watch every single mistake for every single mistake and watch for everything that could possibly go wrong because yeah and then and then beat myself up <laughs> call myself names if i do things wrong because that's the only way i'll get better how sad um, is that? it is it is very very sad but you know what very 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 common and you know when when you work with people at the, most of the time they're not even aware that they're carrying that story and then they they realize that they are and then for the for the most part, they say, wow, that's horrible. I didn't realize I was doing that. Yes. And that can help them detach too. Yeah. But you know what? We live in a we live in a society where like from the time you're born, you are judged, mm -hmm. right? You are judged. You either do something right or you do something wrong. And most of the time, the focus is on guess what? What you've done wrong, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, uh, we don't even um, compliment one another very much if you think about it in, our, in the normal course of conversation it's not like like we go up to people and say you know i really like how you express that opinion in that meeting you know mm -hmm. you, you were very articulate and you said exactly the right things you know we don't so but we often are very verbal when somebody does something wrong you know yes um, this is a really great question, Anonymous, and I think that uh, it's something that we need to be really mindful of. You know, you know, if we're still calling ourselves an idiot, where is that coming from? And like, why do you need to keep hanging on to that? And what happens if you try to, you know, say something positive about yourself? Those yeah. are all important questions, and you know, you want to just consider um, that you can absolutely change it if you if you really want to so change um, the self-talk so when when you would say to yourself oh you idiot why did you do that just say everyone makes mistakes or i don't know maybe replace it with something positive or you did your best you're amazing mm -hmm. you rock you're a rock star you know just change the programs because really our self-talk is often so negative and it's it just brings your whole energy down right and we second guess mm -hmm. ourselves and we question ourselves and and we are we are actually harder on ourselves than anyone else around us. And I think it's time to start being kinder to ourselves. 
Yes. Yeah. And like, how would you treat if you had a, if you saw yourself there as a child, you know, what would you say exactly. to her? If she made a mistake and she's five years old and okay, she broke the cup. What would you say? Would you say you're an idiot or would you say it's okay, honey, there are other cups in the cupboard. No exactly. So, yeah. you know, and treat that, yourself kindly. That is a perfect uh, uh, exercise. I think Lynn to, for people to do is uh, it, it makes such a difference when you, when you see it from the standpoint of it's not you calling yourself an idiot, it's a small child doing something wrong or calling themselves an idiot, how would you deal with it? I think that's a really great way to take yourself out of the equation and really see the truth of it. Really, see I really, I really sometimes wonder where these thoughts even come from. Like, are they even our own thoughts or are is it coming from somewhere else? Because sometimes yeah, I, you can step outside and kind of observe this thought but who's observing the thought and who's thinking this thought and where is this all coming from? Like I, I often worry, you know, I really think about these things because it just doesn't make sense. Yes, it doesn't. If you notice like very, very, very young children, uh, they play, they make a mess, they, you know, fall down, they do whatever. Do you, do you notice them kind of beating themselves up for it? Never. No. Never. no. Or dogs, so you know, when they the make dogs? a mess, do they, yeah, they yeah. don't care. You go clean no. up. They don't care. Exactly. Yes. So we have a lot to learn from them. Yes, we do. So Anonymous, we hope that you give us uh, our, you know, your feedback. Maybe if you try this on yourself to, you know, be your own best friend, your own best coach. And, um, and I hope that uh, you start turning your own mindset around and you start really appreciating yourself. Rather than we are cheering for you and you are amazing. Never forget that. Yes. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, our next uh, and last question comes from Maria. I'm in an unhappy marriage. For many years, I felt that my husband is selfish and takes me for granted. Recently, he forgot my birthday. I'm so angry with him. But angry at myself, too, for letting him treat me this way for so many years, right? I want to take revenge and teach him a lesson. What do you think I should do? <laughs> don't, take, <laughs> don't take revenge. <laughs> That's not the answer. But this, this, this actually really resonates with me because I have a husband who forgets my birthday all the time. Not just birthday anniversaries, everything else. And Maria, with some man, you have to take control. So if you don't want to be disappointed for your on your birthday, and I've learned this in the past 30 years, if you don't want to be, you know, disappointed, remind him of your birthday, um, send him a link as to what you would like, you know, what kind of purse you'd like him to purchase your sunglasses or whatever you would like, send him the link, um, book the restaurant to the or the hotel or book a trip where you'd like to go. And use this as an opportunity to connect with him. Like, for example, my husband, he doesn't like to travel, but if it's my birthday, he can't really say no. So I can say, it's my birthday and we're going here and here and here. And he has to, okay, I'm coming along. So that's kind of my birthday present. So I know that for myself, if I don't want to be disappointed, I need to take matters into my own hands. And that's okay for me, you know? So rather than stepping back and waiting for him to surprise me, and then I'm going to be disappointed year after year because he just forgets. And he's not the type of person to go out and, you know, buy presents and stuff like that. You have to sometimes give them a little bit of a push. And I think that's okay. It doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't love you. It's just some people are like that. Yeah, I agree. And you have to ask yourself, like, what what's the hill that I'm going to die on? Like, <laughs> yeah. is, is this a big enough issue that I am going to start World War Three over it? You know, mm -hmm. Um and, you know, uh, I think what you've said is is great, Lynn. I think that if you want something to happen, you got to make it happen, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of women, and I don't know if this is uh, your issue too, Maria, a lot of women have would have actual trouble with that piece of advice, although it's great. It's a great piece of advice because what they're wanting is that the guy has to take uh initiative and he's the one who has to remember and he's the one who's got to do the planning for the dinner out and all of that otherwise I, it's just not good enough it's just mm -hmm. not good to remind him it's just not good enough and you know what and in, in life we have to accept that we're just not going to get everything we want 
Uh, and and if you want even something close to what you want, you have to do what Lynn said. Right? <laughs> well, you gotta you gotta pick your battles. I mean, yes. I mean, Maria, you start with I'm in an unhappy marriage, so that tells us a lot as well. Like maybe maybe there's a much deeper issue, and and you know maybe this is not why your marriage is not happy. Maybe your marriage is unhappy, and this is just a part of, of the big picture where you know you feel neglected and. Um, not cared for all the time in every aspect of your marriage, in which case, you know, we're talking about a completely different issue than a birthday being forgotten. Yes. Right? Yeah. So I think, right. yeah. So, right. so, you know, if you have lots of other issues going on, of, of course you have to address those. And um, we just kind of focused on the birthday thing because I can, I can definitely really relate to that. But if, if there are other issues, then, then those need to be addressed and fixed if they can be fixed and if it's something that you guys both want to work on and maybe that would help resolve the birthday issue as well but could it be that your husband also feels like he's being taken for granted and maybe he's not feeling nurtured and loved and cared for and maybe that's why he you know he's perhaps feeling angry himself and not feeling so loving towards you so i mean we haven't talked to him or we haven't had the question from him so we don't really know what's happening yeah. but um it really sounds like there's some deeper issues going on there to me yes yeah i would agree i would agree and uh revenge is never oh. uh never a happy outcome there's never a happy outcome from revenge oh, never. so re you have to re always remember the law of attraction you know revenge begets more revenge exactly. and all sorts of negative things and even if you get your husband to do something uh you know through an act of revenge he's going to carry the resentment even mm -hmm. if he doesn't say anything he's going to carry the resentment and he's going to get back at you in another way that's it happens all wow. the time in couples so i never ever advocated for revenge it's just it's just um uh you know nailing the the nail in the coffin of the marriage the more you do that you know? Absolutely. 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 Open the lines of communication. Try to talk to him. Go to counseling if if you guys are inclined to do so. Try to get some help. And I, I really think there are some deeper, deeper issues that need to be addressed. Feel free to write back to us if you if you want us to get into this a little bit deeper. If you want to give us some more information on what's going on, and we're happy to address it in future episodes. So best of luck to you, Maria, and everyone else that wrote to us. Today, we really appreciate all your questions coming in and keep them coming, guys, on all different topics. We are open to anything and everything. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lucille, for all your insight once again. Thank you guys for being here and wishing you all a lovely day. And thank you, Lynn, and thank everybody. And we couldn't be happier being here. We're looking forward to the next episode. Take care, guys. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Please be aware that Lynn and I are here to provide insights, advice, stories that are for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of our content should be considered to be personal, medical, or mental health therapy. If you are experiencing a mental health or physical health challenge, please consult the appropriate healthcare specialist. We are here to provide the best possible content in an atmosphere of positive conversation and personal growth.